Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on refraction and lenses. The topic of this video is critical angle, and we want to know what is a critical angle and how do you calculate it. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. In a previous video, this one, I discussed the phenomenon of total internal reflection. And I've left a link to this video in the description section of this one if you need to review it. Total internal reflection is the phenomenon that occurs when light is in a more dense material and traveling towards the boundary with a less dense material with an angle of incidence greater than the so-called critical angle. To understand the concept of a critical angle, let's study the repeating animation that you see above. Light is traveling from water into to air, and because it's traveling from more dense to less dense, it's refracting away from the normal line. This causes the angle of refraction to be greater than the angle of incidence, and as you increase the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction increases even more. You can imagine that there would be some angle of incidence for which the refracted ray would lie along the boundary line with an angle of refraction of 90 degrees. Now if you think about this situation that occurs for the water to air boundary at about 48 degrees angle of incidence, there's no possible way to get an angle of refraction greater than 90 degrees. So if you increase the angle of incidence greater than 48 degrees, what happens to the refracted ray? The answer is nothing happens. You don't even have a refracted ray. Light that approaches that boundary now undergoes total internal reflection. All the light stays internal to the water and reflects off of that boundary. This occurs for any angle of incidence greater than the critical angle of about 48 degrees for the water to air boundary. And for any angle of incidence less than that angle or equal to it, you'll get reflection and refraction. Now we're prepared to answer the question, what is a critical angle? The first thing to say about the critical angle is that it is a numerical value. The second thing to say is it's a numerical value for the angle of incidence. But not just any old angle of incidence, it's the numerical value for the angle of incidence that causes the light ray to refract along the boundary line at an angle of refraction of 90 degrees. The actual numerical value depends upon the identity of the two materials on opposite sides of the boundary line. It will be a different numerical value for the water to air boundary as it is for the glass to air boundary. When light approaches a boundary, it can be guaranteed to undergo one of two types of behaviors. Either it undergoes reflection and refraction, or it undergoes total internal reflection. If the angle of incidence is less than the critical angle, you can be guaranteed that the light will undergo both reflection and refraction. If the angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle, once more the light will both reflect and refract. But this is the special case of the light ray that refracts is refracting along the boundary line. When the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, there will be no refraction whatsoever the light will instead undergo total internal reflection. Now the question becomes, how do you calculate the critical angle? And the answer is with a formula, a formula that is quite easy to derive using Snell's Law Equation and the definition of the critical angle. I know that when the angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle, the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So I'm going to take 90 degrees and substitute it into the equation for the angle of refraction and the critical angle into the opposite side for the angle of incidence. I know that the value in 1 must be greater than in 2 for light traveling from the more dense to the less dense material. Now to get a critical angle equation, I have to isolate the critical angle by itself on the left side of the equation. So I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by n1. I'm also going to note that the sine of 90 degrees is 1. So the equation becomes the sine of the critical angle is equal to n2 divided by n1. Now in order to get a critical angle formula, I need to take the inverse sine of both sides. The equation becomes the critical angle equal the inverse sine of the ratio n2 divided by n1. This inverse sine function on a calculator is typically found by using two buttons, the sine button and the second button. So find out what n2 divided by n1 is and then go second sine. And when you do, you'll get the critical angle.
Now it's important to note that the value of n1 must be greater than n2 and that ratio of n2 per n1 must be less than 1. If you were to reverse it, you would get a ratio of n2 per n1 that is greater than 1 and your calculator would tell you that there's no answer here. Translated to physics, that means that you only get a critical angle when light is traveling from the material with the bigger n to the material with the smaller n, from more dense to less dense. Now let's try three example calculations using our critical angle formula in our calculator. Let's begin with finding the critical angle for the air-water boundary. To do so, I'm going to take the index of refraction value for air, put it on top, and divide by the 1.33 for water. I'm going to find out what that ratio is, and then using my calculator, I'm going to go second sign to get the inverse sine of that number, and I end up with 48.8 degrees for the critical angle for the water-to-air boundary. Now let's repeat it, but this time for the air diamond boundary. Once more, I'm going to put the smaller index of refraction value on the top, the larger one on the bottom, evaluate the ratio, and then I'm going to do second sin, or inverse sine, in order to find out the critical angle for the diamond to air boundary, and it comes out to be 24.4 degrees. Just so you know, it's not important that air be part of the boundary. It could be something like the boundary between water and glass. Once more, I'm going to put the smaller index of refraction value on the top, divide by the larger index of refraction value, take the inverse sine of that, and I end up with about 61 degrees for the glass to water boundary. Now one thing I want you to note that in all three of these situations, I always put the smaller end value on top, the larger one on the bottom. If I do it the opposite way around, I'm not going to find the answer. This only occurs for light traveling from the big index of refraction material to the small index of refraction material. It ends up that the index of refraction of diamond is relatively large at 2.42, which means that the critical angle for the diamond to air boundary is relatively low at 24 degrees. When you consider all the possible angles of incidence for light approaching the diamond to air boundary, angles between 0 and 90 degrees, the overwhelming majority of those angles are greater than the 24 degree critical angle, which means that when light enters a diamond gemstone, it will often go several reflections before it finally exits the diamond. For example, consider the diamond diagram above with light entering the top face of that gemstone, entering into the diamond and approaching the bottom left face of the gemstone at an angle of incidence greater than the critical angle. The light will undergo total internal reflection and approach the opposite side once more with an angle of incidence greater than the critical angle. It will undergo another TIR before finally exiting the diamond. The multiple reflections of the light within the diamond gemstone is what gives it its brilliance or sparkle, an example of physics for better living. But it's important to note that the cut of the diamond is relatively important, in fact vitally important. You have to make sure that the bottom faces of that diamond are cut at the right angle such that the light is approaching the boundary at angles of incidence greater than the critical angle. Now what I'm about to say right now may be the most important thing I've ever said on this YouTube channel. So listen carefully. Someday some of you are going to go to the jewelry store to buy a diamond and you're going to hear the price and you're going to say to yourself, hmm, how can I get that price down? And you're going to look at that diamond and you're going to probably start thinking to yourself, what a ripoff! Why do I need all that diamond there? The only part that's important is that top part. Can I just get rid of the bottom part there? Why do I need it? It's just a ripoff. Don't go there. Don't go there. But maybe you do. And if you do, you come home with a diamond gemstone that looks something like that. Light enters the top face, approaches the bottom boundary, exits the diamond, no total internal reflection, no sparkle, no physics for better living. Boys and girls, don't do that at home. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comments section below. Now for your action plan. Here are four resources that you'll find on our website, and I've left links to each in the description section of this video. You have a Minds on Physics mission to help you with the concept. You have a set of calculator pad problems to help you practice the math 
math, you have a physics interactive simulation to help you manipulate a variable and observe the result. And finally, there's a tutorial page you can read. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.